Good evening, or perhaps morning, depending on where you are. Oh, well, I'm going to repeat that because I don't think it went through correctly. But good morning or evening, depending on where you are. Evening in the case of the United States. Morning here, you better believe it. It's cold and everything. Welcome to the 710 cast, where your hosts, myself, Tamarack, and Eli Yodi over there, will be talking about all things automotive in various stages. Today, we'll be talking about the lost bodies, segments of the market which we feel have disappeared so, welcome, my hosts today with me are Tamarack. Hello. And the Yodi. Hello. And yes, as mentioned, today we'll be talking about uh, lost bodies, uh, segments of the market which have succumbed to, in some cases, trucks, in some cases, SUVs, but uh, things that it's just very difficult to or impossible to buy now. Yeah, things that have slowly gone away just due to the progress of the market and focus groups and just the evolving and changing world of automotive and how it's slowly kind of transitioning away from certain styles and into others as it is kind of want to do since the beginning of its creation. In some cases. Ex expect much ranting. Well, far too much ranting. The lamentation uh, of things we love to see gone away. The wailing and gnashing of teeth. Exactly. Your teeth. Um, oh, but yes, I mean, that's, uh, you're having a real bad day then. <laughs> find them, don't grind them. Uh, if you can't find them, grind them. <laughs> I just yes, heard uh, grinding and I'm here for it. And <laughs> there's the fox. Oh. Uh, as expected. But yeah, um... Also, to note, in terms of uh, forces driving that is a lot of uh, manufacturers are doing their best to get everything onto either a single platform or a very small selection of platforms, especially with the shift across to electric uh, vehicles and hybrids availability in a lot of platforms. Platform engineering is complex, so having multiple platforms is uh, wasted money as they see it. But uh, we, we kind of find our selection of vehicles reducing, not increasing, being a little bit sad. A little bit, yeah. I mean, that's that's definitely one way to say it, for sure. But uh, first, we might cover a couple of news points. Uh, one in particular, speaking of electric vehicles. Yes, here we go. As soon as I can figure out how to operate my life. <laughs> Hertz will be supplied by General Motors with 175,000 electric cars over the next five years. That's 35,000 a year average. Which not only is impressive in terms of you're going to be taking all of these off the market for one single buyer, which admittedly shouldn't be too hard. They have four to model after as far as most of the government contracts in the US, but to produce that many electric vehicles specifically for one manufacturer, especially in a growing segment, is a, it's a bold strategy, Cotton. Yeah, I'm really hoping it does pay off for them because that's a great way to bolster not only fleet production, but you're looking at increasing exposure to purchases, increasing the amount of experience people have with electric cars, and I find that experience is probably the thing that's mitigating people purchasing them uh to be honest that and you also they're they're it's smart i can see a little bit of what they're doing and they're kind of playing the long game in that i mean their dealerships are relatively separate from the main entity but they're still creating an opportunity where in three years when these fall out of i mean it's a standard Rotation time is about three years for rental cars just because that's when they start to fall out of their factory warranties. Once they fall out of factory warranties, then Hertz is no longer going to want to hold on to them for repair costs. It's just not smart for their business model. That's how they run things. So they're going to send all these to auction after a little while. And once they do that, Chevy dealers are going to grab these up left and right because they're going to turn them all into certified pre-owned vehicles 
And after the familiarity that Kaji was talking about, plus that strategy, I think they're going to be getting a lot of these cars out there on the road. They're going to be creating just a lot of market share out of them. And all I can picture is 175,000 confused boomers out of electricity on the side of the road. Hank, <laughs> <laughs> ain't got no gas in it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know what to do. Where do I put the dinosaur juice in? How does this work? But yeah, um, I think that's a really smart idea. Familiarizing the public with them, really democratizing electric cars, because a lot of people at the moment don't have the facility or think they couldn't live with one, where really they could, they just don't know. And not only that, it's also, I mean, relatively good for Hertz because they're going to be centralized locations, so they don't have to run power every freaking where. Once they're out of the lot, that's the customer's problem. But while they're there, it hurts. I'm sure they're going to be able to pipe up enough energy to keep their fleet charged. I can see problems at some of the smaller rental agencies, but I'm sure it'll uh, just be a matter of a fairly simple refit, putting three phase in and a couple of charge points and going from there. Mm -hmm. But I'm especially talking about a lot of the bigger, like, uh, airport locations, stuff that's going to have access to high power end lines. Oh, goodness, yeah. Places like Hartsfield, Jackson, and Los Angeles. O'Hare, mm. New York. Well, and I, I think Which we've one? all rented a vehicle that we weren't sure that we would like, but by the end of our term, we're like, this didn't suck. I kind of like it. I can't say that. I did a Mazda 3 and I hated the thing the entire time. <laughs> Um, weirdly enough, the only experience I've had with that is renting challenges and going, oh, hey, the automatic isn't terrible. Surprisingly enough, I can enough, just no. relate from, I can relate from renting, getting upgraded to an SRT8 scat pack charger one time and giggling the entire time I, I used it. <laughs> it's hard not to. We actually got something in chat here. Mini Countryman versus Nissan Cube. Ooh. In Ooh, interesting, interesting. Nissan Q didn't go for long enough for me. If it had a longer lifespan, I might have chosen it over the Mini, but just because of the long-lasting commitment the BMW group has made to Mini, I'm probably going to go that direction. In my case, Nissan Cube, because I've serviced both of them. Which is also fair. I'm sure I'm getting myself into a world of trouble with this Mini BMW situation. And I'll just chime in from the fact that I hate the asymmetric design of the Nissan Cube. <laughs> and every time I see one, all I can think of is, uh, what's his name? Give me the cube. Boy. You know what? Aesthetic is an important thing to, to take into consideration when choosing a vehicle. If it's going to trigger your OCD all the time, don't do it. Don't do it. Now, uh, anything more on our news story? I mean, I, I think we've, Dug into it. Kaji, you're the leader. You're the ringleader this time around. What do you think? I am the ringleader. Get in the fridge. The, um... <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just think it's uh, pretty cool that we've got uh, that uh, movement going on, just that uh, big purchase. And more to the point, from a manufacturer that isn't Tesla, uh, thus kind of helping the transition a little bit. But I think that's about it. Let's move on to what we've lost, shall we? Uh, as mentioned, the consolidation of body styles is probably the biggest driving factor to the loss of a whole bunch of categories, uh, as is market pressure, the erasure of smaller vehicles in favor of larger vehicles. Uh, probably the biggest thing you see with that is in trucks, uh, where people tend to buy larger trucks because they think they're going to need it later on, even if the biggest thing they ever put in the back is a case of beer. Uh, and that's tended to see the overall vehicle size in the United States, for instance, increasing pretty quickly, as well as Australia. Uh, China is a bit of a different scenario because they simply didn't have private cars of a reasonable size for a long time, so that's been spiking for different reasons. Um, as for which categories we miss, 
Uh, for the first category, I'm going to be handing it across to Tam. Tam, which vehicles that are missing do you miss the most? Tonight, I shall be pouring one out for the station wagon. Uh, your or wagon. to... Or to our overseas users, the estate, which in doing my research this afternoon originally resulted from uh, these vehicles originally being mainly used at train stations to take rich people and their baggage to their estates. Now I know <laughs> why the Brits called them estates. I learned something every day. Today I did. But yeah, my, my love affair with these things is very personal as way back in the day I used to be a bass player in many uh, bands back home and I only could have one vehicle and when you are a member of a band uh, you're required to shag your own equipment to all your gigs and when you can only have one vehicle what better one to put it in than something that has a bunch of room in the back and what was your war wagon? Uh, my very first wagon was a 1995 Subaru Legacy um, with a five-speed manual. I wish I had a picture of it queued up for you, but it was... Oh, perfect. We'll just do this then. Yep, that silver one right there that you see, uh, except mine was blue. It looked exactly like that. Oh, well, well there, there's one second row down, third to the right. It's It looked exactly, precisely like that one. That very same blurple color. <laughs> yeah, kind of like no, a, this a was... forest green and kind of an aqua had a love child. That was That's what that is. Yep, and it was not the much maligned 2.5 liter with all its head gasket and heater. Oh, so two liter. The two good old 2.5. 2.2, yes. 2.2, two, two, yes, yes, yes. The one where you could snap a timing belt and then wrap some piece of uh, belt around it and just continue down the road. Hmm. Shoestrings tied together. I've seen it happen. Yeah. Not for very but yeah, long, but it happened. And I've, I've always been of the opinion that these were killed off by the crossover SUV stage, which... If you think about it, a crossover SUV is really just a wagon on stilts. They have a little bit more ground clearance, but functionally, they're practically the same. And if nothing else, might actually have less interior space than an actual wagon. It's true facts. Many of them could have been had in all-wheel drive, four-wheel drive, but it's it's that mentality of i'm up high so i feel safe that mm -hmm. the suv craze brought around and it killed the wagon and admittedly they were much maligned by the boomer generation who grew up in the 60s 70s 80s as wagons weren't cool but there is a non-zero part of the automotive enthusiast segment that thinks wagons are the coolest thing in the world and I'm pointing at myself even though you can't see it. <laughs> I think you'd have more than a few of us agreeing with you on that point. But they're a car that you can live with every day. You can take it to work, you can go to the hardware store with it, and the possibilities with it are absolutely endless. Ultimate and road trip now, vehicles. Absolutely, yeah. You can just throw all of your bags and all of your friends. My second station wagon was a uh, my Subaru. Uh, well, my second Subaru, my WRX, which that kind of straddles the line between hatchback and wagon because it was a very short wagon. I'm specifically re referring to mid and full size station wagons. In Australia, that model was called a sport wagon. That, oh. Like that one. That exact car. That was my car. And I miss it very much. That sob story will be said in a future episode, possibly. It, it was the one that got away. Which that is but, an idea for a future episode. But yeah, and 
Concurrently, I had that with a Volvo V70 wagon, which Volvo arguably made the best wagons in history. Rough year? Uh, it was 2004, which would have been the P2. Searching for that now, are you? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Querying. Woohoo! There we go. We got a couple up there. Oh, and yeah, and that was my first introduction to <gasps> Ooh, the European. R. Yeah. Oh, don't, let's not talk about the R. We don't talk about the R here. Um, that was my first introduction to heated seats, which I will never go without from now on. But yeah, absolutely wonderful vehicle. Inline 2.4 cylinder or 2.4 liter five cylinder. I'm sorry. Um, smooth as glass, plenty of power, shitty gas mileage, but what do you want? It's a big box. You can put all your stuff in it. It's fair. It was a, it was a couch on wheels. I had a wagon as well, which I was very fond of and I miss. Uh, and for me, it was probably the best vehicle I've owned, um, in terms of a mix of comfort, reliability, and ease of servicing, easy to look after. Uh, I don't have a photo of mine. Oh, hang on. Yes, I do. You do? I'll drop them in the channel. And yes, to uh, to our commenter Bucket Monkey's point, Subaru station wagons and Foresters are still very popular here. Yes, but we will get to that in a moment because they don't make them anymore. <laughs> oh, am I showing your Accord wagon? You can if you oh, like. The Accord wagons were wonderful. These Another are terrible one, yes. because I was an idiot and this is like was when I had my first smartphone. I don't really take photos of my stuff much. Smartphones operated by dumb people? Yes. There you go. A CB9 wagon. Oh, that's the perfect uh, yes. generation. We got yeah. those here as well. Mine was made in the United States, as they all were. Made in Marysville, Ohio. Marysville, Ohio. Yes, been there many times. The last good hmm. thing to come out of Ohio. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> what? They know what they did. <laughs> this train is carrying jobs out of Cleveland. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yes, no. Uh, my Accord wagon was a treat, and I, I miss it dearly. Met an unfortunate end, and by end I mean Commodore. Oh, oh no! That's that's a yeah. pretty solid end. Oh yes. Yeah. Right. This afternoon, my my research led me to start looking for if I was a rich bitch, la 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 la, la, la and <laughs> I had money, which I don't. Who would I go to to buy a wagon from today? There are only a few manufacturers who still make them. And Yodi, I believe you have pictures for me. Yes, I do. These are going to be coming at you in uh, um, alphabetical Name. order of make. Let's do it. The Audi S6 Avant. Which what literally is more... a pretty thing, if not for the rims. Sorry. Shut up. It's fine. But what more could you possibly want? It's gorgeous. It's fast. You can fit you and all your friends and all your luggage in it and get there yesterday. Next. Post haste. Mercedes, the E-Class, the uh, a staple of station wagons. I don't Better. much care for it, but it is what I would like to have. Oh, boy. You're going to hate me. That'd be my choice. I don't hate you for it. I'd have one. Out exactly. of all those, I'd probably say the same. Versatile. That and, I mean, worldwide support, it's nothing, it's not fast or fancy. It's just an wagon. But yeah. so comfortable. Yeah, oh yeah. What What else do we have queued up? <laughs> well, it, the Porsche Panamera Sport Turismo. <laughs> Which does look good. I like you, the look of that. You can't not like it. It's a Porsche that you can fit three friends and stuff in, but it's unreasonable. So move on. Next. Icon wagon win. The Volvo V60 
Recharge, which is a hybrid. Yes. I can't hate that. Yeah, I, everything about it is heart. good. Especially like the looks, nose of it. It looks nice. It's a handsome looking thing. It's a hybrid. It's fast. Um, it, it, But sadly, every single one of these examples that we've shown can't be touched for less than $70,000 base. Yep. So there's nothing there's nothing affordable out there in this segment. So so if you're buying something, you know, you're committing to it, or just unable to entirely. Yeah, we're lucky and, in Australia how we get Skoda, which means that we get the Octavia wagon, which sits at about, I think it's uh, if from memory about forty thousand Australian fun bucks. Which that's median ish right now pretty reasonable and now you know why this fox's heart is forever broken it is a shame that they're not as popular as they once were because i mean the i mean the ultimate station wagon the griswold wagon that was something that i will never forget the family truckster exactly <laughs> and, and just that style of vehicle i remember my grandfather in his day having an old 1980s Buick station wagon that still had the third row jump seats in the back. That was all manner of fun. So, yeah. Similarly, wagons are painted in my past as well. And I do adore them. I yes. think it's one of those things the SUV kind of took over because people have assumed that third row seats were a new idea. And they very much weren't. I can vividly remember long road trips in my father's 87 Caprice wagon with my brother and I sitting in the rear facing third row seats with the rear window slightly rolled down, huffing exhaust fumes. Oh, yeah, like interesting. In a Bucket Monkey threw in there as a contender. Let me see if I can't find his suggestion. It was the Jaguar oh. XF wagon. Let's oh. see about that. Jaguar. The car Bucket you drive if you're is my baddie. He, the Bucket Monkey is my new favorite person right now. Thank uh, you for even existing. Yeah, doing research so you don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. Okay, yeah. That's a thing. That's nice. That's quite nice. In my research, the, looking at Jaguar never even occurred to me. So thanks for that. And it's the, like quite um, a pretty looking thing at that. I yeah. bet it makes all the right noises, too. I'm sure. And it also can look very refined. That's got and enough could, height in the back, you'd be able to use it, too. Mm -hmm. You could steal all of the silverware at the party you went to, and it's a <laughs> jag. <laughs> I like that. Sorry, no, ripping, ripping off other IPs. But yeah, on that crushing disappointment... Yodi, Let's what do you got for across. us? Now, for the segment I chose, that's something that's disappearing, and it's disappearing rapidly, especially amongst mm, domestic, for us domestic, and, uh, automakers. I'm thinking Dodge, Ford, Chevy. I am lamenting the death of the small sedan slash coupe slash hatch or city car. Something that... You could buy for, uh, you know, less than 15, 16,000 bucks out the door brand new. Or if you found them used, you're paying anywhere from 12 to 15 and they're not utter chintzy cheap quality. I'm not talking about the Aveo. I'm talking about nicer stuff like the old Tercels. Maybe you could have that as a cheaper car and then you have an enthusiast something on the side that you drive on the weekends. Or... This is famously another uh, a car that grandmothers and grandfathers absolutely adored and would just retire with because they don't need much. But in doing a lot of my research, I'm just going to show you the kind of things I came across and their counterparts. What I found left for Chevrolet, uh. their offerings are the Spark. That's Which I all. Which I don't hate. <laughs> <laughs> I don't hate them. I'm not terribly mad at it. It's cheap. The only, oh man, you've got a, that face though. That's a fat guy going Meh, at a cheeseburger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got a cheeseburger. All right, all right. It needs to be a segment in the future. Cars with faces. Oh, hundred percent. I love cars with faces. 
Um, but yeah, you can see their other other uh, car offerings. You have the Spark or the Malibu. That's the it. the Malibu is <laughs> yeah. The Malibu is a, what I would consider a, like a mid-level vehicle. Mm. A rental uh, car. Other than that, you're going over to EV, which suddenly shoots you up almost $15,000, almost double the price of their nearest small gas competitor. Mm. So Chevy has everything else is trucks, SUVs, or performance, which admittedly the Corvette's a delight, but it's also sixty-five grand. <laughs> also, why can't we have a Camaro Ute? Oh, that would be delightful. Profile. It could it could be one. It would work so well, especially this most recent generation. But if you want to look back at something in the past that was a great, I mean, it survived for years and years, look no further than the Cavalier. You had everything from a coupe, episode. a sedan, a wagon. Yay, buddy. Ah, yes. You kept the one platform, but you spread it across many things. And yes, you even had the performance model. Ah, uh, quote the unquote. But that's they, the thing is, got, you had one for platform, and that was five body styles that could appeal to anyone from across a range of fresh college graduate to grandma. Everything in between. And it's just something that's just gone the way of the dinosaur. Like I said, you don't have that. All you have is, do you want a spark? How many extra badges do you want on the back with how many small in upgrades to the interior? There's really not a lot left from them as an offering. Similarly, uh, my, uh, go ahead. I was just going to say, do I get to make you sad? I'm, I'm already sad, but go ahead. You always make us sad. I know. Uh, I, I've just dropped a, a picture in the uh, chat of something that you could get in Japan that wasn't sold in the United States. Based on the same platform as the Cavalier, the Isuzu Asuka Turbo. Bring it up. Oh, oh. that's a nice little thing. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Ermsha wheels and a turbocharger. There's nothing not to like there. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's actually quite a handsome little thing. It's got some nice quad headlights going on. It's very 90s in its day. Uh, it's unassuming. It's bad. It's from 1985. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, I would have put that early 90s. I was mm. one years old. <laughs> you said 85? Yes, yeah, I wasn't. 85. I was still a glimmer Same in somebody's me. eye. But. You pop. Yeah, uh, uh, of the group, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> First time in a long time, let me tell you. Oh, man. So Click now we're going to move on. Button. My next example is that. Ford. What does Ford have for us? Well, SUVs and crossovers, like we said, trucks and vans, like we said, lots of big things. We go over to cars. What do we have for car? Uh, a oh. Mustang. A Mustang. You can get a Mustang. That's all you can get. You, you can just get a Mustang. That, that's that's all you get. Yep. Oops. All Mustangs. Um, electric. Would you like an SUV, a truck, or a Mustang? There's not even anything small in electric. They don't even have a small electric offering. Their smallest electric offering is the Maverick. That's it. Maybe the Escape is similarly sized, but it's also 10,000 more than the base level Maverick. They're just tiny. They've gone they've gone to SUVs, trucks, and one performance car. Back in the day, again, you want to get something that's one platform that covers a big range. The Escort. The Escort was a coupe, a hatchback, a sedan, a wagon. It we don't was... talk about the Cosworth here. No, because we never got it, and it makes me sad. Well, we did. We got the uh, the Mercury, the X Ready. Uh, that one. Yes, that's uh, right. That's a Sierra, not a Escort. Yeah. Quiet, you. <laughs> but even the successor to that, Ford kept on going with the same idea, and they made the Contour, which again, Mondeo. Yeah, or Mondeo for those of you who are in Britland. They have. It never came in a coupe, as far as my knowledge goes. It does come in a sedan. I've owned one of these before. They're fine. It's They've, fine. I've fit three people on a road trip into one of these, and none of us complained. We all had enough room. There was enough room for our luggage. It also had a nice sports model, which I've been chased away from by various people in the past because I'm not a <laughs> full-service mechanic. And it also had a wagon, another one that I've actually driven before, but are a little bit tougher to find. I'm sure it's out there, though. 
One of the things that killed the contour for me is the fact that it came out during Ford's melted cheese era. It's true. Where, and they had that god awful round oval back window. Ugh. Yeah, but I mean, I Ford like has had. Course. Yeah, they've had plenty of options, and even then, if you wanted to step up, if you were moving on up, and you had you were growing, or your family was growing, one of the two. This is America, after all, and drive-throughs are a thing. Then you the could tourist. move up to the Taurus. Exactly. That is a mid-size, still reasonably priced car that came in a multitude of configurations up to and including a sports model and this SHO. So, okay. So America is definitely floundering there, right? Well, I mean, that doesn't, that just speaks for the thus here. Or most of us here in the North America side. What about uh, across the seas? All right, let's go to Nissan, right? And Nissan's again, they've, they've been a, a flag holder before they've had the Sentras. They've had, uh, Tercels, they've had a number of vehicles that could be in that area. Now, your lowest is the Versa, which is admittedly a rel relatively small car, but starts at 15K. It's reasonable. Next up is Sentra, and then you get to mid and full size, or electric. Not More offerings than most, but still not a lot of configuration in there. I know the Versa comes in kind of a hatchback wagon or did in previous years. At least Nissan has stayed true to the Sentra Altima Maxima lineup where it was small, medium, large. Yeah, absolutely. And they've kept that for as long as I can recall, at least back into the 80s, possibly 70s. I don't know how far back some of those badges go, but it's also they kind of changed company names around that time, too. A bit. Sentra actually is uh, surprisingly good value in the segment as well. For what you get. They're not, not bad. bad looking things. I'm still, I'm not a huge Nissan fan. That's a personal opinion, but they also, they have done a lot that I can admire and respect. But then again, otherwise, if you're looking at them, okay, the leaf is there. That looks like a big thing. Sports cars, trucks, crossovers, SUVs. Uh -huh. If we jump back, there are I others in there. You have the I think NX, my favorite quote that sums up Nissan is the spoof on their catchphrase, inspiration that's meh. <laughs> yeah, okay, and, and, and bits and bits and pieces and ways. I mean, there's definitely some things that will make you not quite go eh right now, but that's another discussion. <laughs> but yes, in ah, the past, the hard they've... body. I had one of those. Exactly. <laughs> one you know, in small truck was delightful. I mean, a Nissan hard buddy was, they're still running around today somehow, but in other cars you had, yeah, you had the NX, which was a hatchback. It was also a front wheel drive hatchback, which meant it actually had a decently sized boot that you could fold the rear seats down on. It made for a lot of room in that tiny car, the 240 SX, which was the 180 SX. As far as I know, down where you're at Kaji, uh, we didn't get them. Uh, they sold the 180SX in Japan, which we got as a grey import. And in uh, yeah. England, they got them as a 200SX, which still had a 1.8 liter engine for some reason. Uh, don't ask me. I don't know. Got it. Yeah. I forgot about that grey import era you guys had. And we also did as well here a little bit. Mm. There are a few Nissan... Skylines running around that have been here for far too long to be legal. But yeah, and Nissan has also kind of gone that way. Less so than more local uh, makes and models. But I mean, it's still, it seems we're, we're moving away and kind of people are getting rid of their cars. Yeah, we're just moving into this gray, silver, white, and black sludge of generic SUVs and crossovers. They all look the same. And it's very depressing. I think the color thing is the worst for me. The fact that everyone has just decided, I'm going to buy a car. What color are you going to get? Some variant of silver. Yeah. It's I monochrome. Sell a light silver. I'll get that. It's just <laughs> Light a, silver, dark silver. 
Yeah, there's there's two colors. There's white and there's black, and there's a slider to go between. Choose where that slider lands, and that's about all you got. Maybe if you get really bold, you can add a drop of dark red or maybe some brown. Brown. <laughs> I, I think it's very sad that more cars don't come in yellow these days. Yeah, and you know what? As much as I admittedly a little bit judged the thing, because holy cow, uh, when Honda, the last few years, they had a Honda Civic in green that was a what the f- Frick green. It was I a, love it. Whoa. But I applaud them for it because it was something other than black, silver, white. If you're lucky, red. Yeah. Again, <laughs> well, if you're lucky, they threw in a little but spice. Only flat red. Yeah. Mazda Mazda does have that absolutely gorgeous soul red. Soul red, yeah. That Man, beautiful that's a pretty color. color. Um Probably my favorite green is close Edgedly. to that green. Uh, that would be Spitfire Green from Holden. It was on the uh, last of our Commodores. Ah, uh, yes. I like the name too, Spitfire Green. It just sounds like it's going to be angry. <laughs> what I love is the fact that no two photos are the same because it just confuses all the cameras. <laughs> <laughs> Brings back memories of the war. Oh, hey. Basically, that green is uh, oh. if you swallowed a few highlighters, inhaled a few more, and then stared <laughs> at a sheet of fluorescent green, you've got roughly the right color. Not terribly wrong. It's, it's so bright. It definitely kicks out there. Mm. I will admit, as I've gotten older, my appreciation for very bold colors has really come to the forefront maybe that's a midlife crisis thing we'll talk about that another time yeah that's actually another good one mark it down flag it all right like it so kaji what have you got for us i have got the most australian category of car there is and i'll hear no argument at all utes Uh, uh, which we never got kind of not true but we did see we got some the the history of these things, they started as uh, a bloke went to Ford and he said he wanted a car that he could take the pigs to market on Monday after ch- taking the family to church on Sunday. And Ford Australia came up with the ute, a car with the essentially the body shape of a deluxe coupe uh, with a short bed behind it. Unlike the pickups that came before, it didn't have a basic rudimentary cabin, it had all the accoutrements that you'd get in a two-door, but uh, in a ute with a bed. So you could do ute stuff with it. After Ford did theirs, Holden came along with their interpretation based on their FX. Oh, that's small. I thought it was bigger. Anyway. Oh, let me get a little uh, juice. Yeah, based on the uh, FX, which was based on the 48215. That's got an inline uh, inline six engine, a three speed manual on the tree, and that's uh, a, was a staple of country towns until I was a kid. That's how long those were running around. I mean, that's all you need. That's the inline six, and that's I mean, that's what you that you get a three on the tree. It's incredible. I can still go to a re, uh, repco nearby and get a head gasket for that. <laughs> Just straight up. That's they incredible. made that three point three liter for so long. Um, grab the next one for me. Uh, that would be the green. I'm going to guess. Oh, let me switch back over here. Oh, it doesn't want me to let me do it when it's zoomed. <laughs> it's angry. If I guess in the Falcon. That's a Falcon Ute. These were uh, Australia's first Falcons. Uh, it has a hat. We got the Utes and sedans <laughs> at the same time. This has a number of features which became fairly standard sort of points of utes. If you look at the back, it's got a rail for a tunnel. And yeah, uh, the visor up the top, common on highway uh, highway utes, stuff that ran the highways. Oh, that's yeah, right, because that you thing. guys have all the laws down there that says you got to have your load covered. You can't just go spilling out everything on the highway. That's right. Ah, you health and safety. loads in this country. Hey, it means I don't get uh, screws in my tire like my friend in Alabama who got three in one week. Yeah, I've experienced that before. (laughs) 
Um, if you'll grab, do me the courtesy of grabbing me the next one. Doot. This, however, is an American ute. These guys started appearing in the 1950s in the United States. Um, I think the product managers at the Ford Motor Company cast an eye to over towards us, and the Ranchero was born based on the Crown Victoria bodies. You also had the El Camino around this time, which was based on the Impala, and that's a 1958 example. And they Beautiful. actually proved really popular uh, because they gave a lot of versatility to sportsmen and families who wanted a second car that let them do uh, truck stuff without having to have a truck because trucks really weren't seen as desirable at that point. They were just seen as a work vehicle. And how do we spell truck in around here? Ah, uh, no, that's one truck in particular. T-R-U-K in caps. It reminds yes. me of something that's relatively funny, that specifically to the El Camino, and I have to bring this up because it's just a funny, giggly moment. And it is... Where did you park? Next to the car that looks like a suspicious stone vampire. What? The car. <laughs> I will so never cool. unsee it. Yeah. <laughs> the best part is that's in Australia. I know that car. Yeah. yeah. Yep. I love those. <laughs> but yes, no, that was that away. style of tail lights. Yeah. <laughs> the 58 uh, Impalas and El Caminos. Um, love them. Anyway, yes. Uh, if you'll do me the courtesy. Moving along. Uh, the ah, El Camino G -body. continued in the United States for a very long time. Uh, it was the last of the Utes to leave the US with the G-Body. This was the final shape. Never had uh, one, always wanted one. Always wanted it's, one. What I like is these things were well built enough that despite the malignment they got at the time, there's still plenty of them around. And there's lots of support for them being a G-Body too. Um, I've got a desire to convert one into like a GNX clone. <laughs> But uh, they're incredible. Anyway, that's a that's a G body El Camino, the last of the American Utes in Australia. Though we kept them. Lucky. That's a XD Falcon. These oh. guys were. Do you know uh, what? The, hmm? I'm going to have to interrupt and say that that really isn't the last Ute that we had. It's the last oh. one that we had wasn't very popular. Oh. Brady do tell the rampage. Oh, oh I forgot yes, the about rampage. those. My apologies. Mm -hmm. I apologize, Lee Iacocca. This I'm is the first you. time I've got to do an actually. Yeah, um, go. actually, actually, this is the first time. Oh, I'm so excited. Anyways, continue on. I do like the rampages though. Uh, I especially like the turbo Shelby ones. Oh so yeah, the Shelby the ones that's uh, the CSX, the experimentals. Yes, yes. What is that monstrosity on the bottom left? Oh, um, um, looks like somebody lifted there. <laughs> oh no, you ruined it. Wait, hold on. Why does it have a? Let's close that before I've got too many questions. <laughs> <laughs> what about this one though? I mean, we can keep asking questions. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> Anywho. <laughs> no, there's your there's your uh, Carol Shelby Rampage. Yes. Limited edition. They also made those in the Spirit America and uh, the Omni. The Omni GLH for Goes Like Hell. Yes. Hell yes. I do like the GLH as a designation. It's fun. Mm -hmm, but, absolutely. Uh, anyway, to come back to Australian Utes. That is an XD Falcon. They were the last generation for a while to get a V8. Two, they were available with a Cleveland, which we got Cleveland V8s in Australia long after the US abandoned them for the modified. Uh, because for whatever reason, we just got the molds, the parts, all of that stuff. And anyway, uh, if you'll move on to the next one for me, that became the X. This, if you look at the doors, they're the same shape. That's an XH. Uh, that was the last on that platform. Uh, I like the look which of the front clip, are now though. old enough to be are now old enough to be imported into the US US viewers. They are. Might consider. And they fit a 5 liter V8 in the nose or you can have them with the stock Intec 6, a very nice uh engine. That particular one is an XR6, which means it's got a custom cam, custom uh exhaust header and makes a bit more power than a standard XR6. Uh 
if you'll flick me the next one. This was Australia's take on the quad cab ute before quad cab utes became quad cab utes. What we call a quad cab ute here is really just a pickup, which is unfortunately more proof that the segment is dead, but we'll get onto that in a moment. That's a crewman, uh, the Cross 8 version, which was a V8 more powerful one called an Adventurer because it's lifted. Ooh. Anywho, um, Ooh. Yeah, it's got an all-wheel drive so you, system and everything. You'd, you'd say it was the Outback version? Pretty much, yeah. That's actually a good descriptor. Yeah. Except they were all-wheel drive, whereas like the regular ones were real-wheel drive, unlike the Subarus. But anyway, uh, next couple of photos, because these were the oh. last Utes. That I is guess. a FPV Super Pursuit. That ass. Mm. 400 and change horsepower, big brakes. Uh, 5.4 litre V8 in that one. And later on, they got the Miami, the 5 litre that we had here. And Ooh. of course, Hold oh. Malou. The Malou. Oh. I'm down for that. that. Yes. Yep. Want it. Give me, please. In my opinion, the ultimate expression of the Ute as a uh, sports car that can do more. Um, they're available it just looks good too. Everything. Yes, they're available with everything right up to 570 horsepower. Uh, and yeah, ridiculous brakes, as you can see on that one. Big old AP racing brakes. And Just, a tonneau cover. Yes, indeed. Keep your goods, uh, keep your goods secured. Uh, central locking worked on that too. Huh. Clever. But yes, uh, and that segment is gone with the end of car production in Australia. No more Australian utes. Uh, that is a... I can't remember what year that one in particular is, but the 2017s were the very last. Uh, actually, yeah, you got the W1 handy? Yes. GDSR W1. That is the last expression of an Australian ute. Uh, that and one what an expression. An, oh, hell yeah. LS9, six-speed manual, to be precise, TR6060. Um, even bigger brakes, because we need more, apparently. <laughs> if you're going to have the woe, you got to have... If you're, rather, if you're going to have the go, you got to have the woe. Unfortunately, wow. these things got killed off by uh, what Australians will call dual-cab utes. Uh, which are really just small pickups. Ford Rangers, Toyota Hiluxes. Um, uh, what I think is really sad, though, is a lot of these people uh, bought the dual cab ute because it was quote-unquote more practical, which is fine if you're carrying people, but these things are for carrying stuff, and a dual cab ute isn't very good at it. They've got a short bed. They don't have much room. Mm -hmm, they're mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. not particularly versatile. <laughs> And, like, they're better for going off-road and stuff, sure, but most of them never see anything more complicated than a nature strip. As, like, most things around here, too. I mean, nine times out of ten, the people that have the big trucks or even the, you know, what we call would be a midsize, you know, the Ford Ranger. Yeah. Uh, most of them are pavement princesses. You, you're never going to see anything more than a Home Depot parking lot at its most useful. Or a road with a country road with some wet leaves on it. Goodness forbid. Oh, I got to turn on four wheel drive for that. <laughs> if you're on your hog, you'd have to lay her down. Those, those <laughs> grass clippings. Oh, hey, oh. I, I just happened to notice an Aveo in the background. <laughs> That's a Hyundai Getz. They were a car that uh, wasn't sold in the US, I don't think. No, we didn't it ever It looks an awful lot like an Aveo. It really does, and though. Weird, it does, but they're not related. Um, that's uh, Hyundai Kia developed that guy there. But anywho, um, there is, however, hope for the Ute. Oh? If you would, Yote. Where am I clicking? The Mav. You sent me things. Hold on. I have to find the I things that you sent you me. I didn't send you this thing. Just grab the web page for it. But you had it open earlier. The Ford uh, Ford web page. The Maverick. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. I, can, I can open that thing up. Yeah. Please. Controversial opinion. Not Ooh. a ute. Uh, I would kind <laughs> of agree. Not a ute. Ford. I'd happily call it a ute. Because no. the crossover is taken over as the family car, and this is just a crossover with a bed. 
this is a car, but, but it's it has, a truck, which it makes has it a four, It has four doors. The shape is all wrong. I don't like it. I think and the nose is what kills it for me as a ute. There were four-door utes before. You saw the crewman slash adventurer. Yeah, no, absolutely. Much, what I'm saying is it's got too much clearance. of a bullied nose. For most part, uh, from what I've seen, utes are, it's the front end of a car. So it looks like a car, but it has the utility as a ute of a truck bed behind it. This has the face of a truck. Maybe, but it's got the body of a car and that sells it to me as a ute. That's I'm fair. just really glad to see uh, lightweight, useful vehicles because the nice part about a ute is it's a car underneath with car brakes, car drivetrain. It's as easy to look after as a car and as cheap to service and run. By the way, if that those people are... I don't think that the Maverick actually has the towing capacity to pull the boat that it's presently holding on to. I could... Probably be convinced otherwise, but um, hauling boats around, that's going to be close to its limit to a point that it it'd, might get a little sketchy sometimes. It'd be unhappy about it. Especially since if it's the CVT, then it's going, or rather if it's the hybrid, then it's going to have the CVT, which is probably not going to be happy about that very much. Uh, but the regular versions or the off-road version might be happier about it with a standard transmission. I don't know. I'll have to look it up. I'm curious. You know? Yeah. I'm just leaving that and like, man, you're selling a lifestyle that you may not be able to live if you buy that thing. <laughs> so we'll leave this up to the chat and the comments. Is the Maverick a ute? The answer is no. Yeah, let us know. <laughs> let us know what you think and we'll let you know if you're wrong. How about that? <laughs> if you think yes, you're wrong. <laughs> Simply put, don't even comment. So uh -huh. says right set up cat font. Cat dog. It's thing. got five. It's got five stud wheels. <laughs> so is your Anywho. mom. <laughs> yes, she does on her uh, no. Volvo sedan. <laughs> when I think of Utes, I think of again. If we're going to go back to the one that got away, um, my example of the one that got away that I should have bought it was going oh, to be no. a '73 variant that I nearly yeah. bought. But it was a sparkly green and had the delightful wood trim package going down the side. It was quite a machine. Last of the big bodies. Yeah, and it still had the uh, the little cut-off circle taillights to them that some of the earlier Chevys had. Huh. Ah, and the lights down in the, uh, the bumper because they can't be on a moving piece of bodywork. Mm-hmm. But no, I nearly, the, uh, nearly bought one of these. I almost sold a couple of projects that I had in the wings just so that I could go to this little roadside stealer ship and grab the thing. It wasn't an SS, but it was still an El Camino. It would have been my only one. And yeah, I, I regret not grabbing it because it's funky. It has those big safety compliant bumpers and <laughs> it's right ugly in all the right ways. Um, Just quickly before we move on to uh, our last segment of the day uh tam you might want to get ready for that one i uh, just found that you can actually get a tow package for the maverick which lets it tow four thousand pounds that's i'm impressed that yeah. might be a boat that's, that's probably a boat, a boat yeah because your boat's about 800 kilo and your trailer's about 600 so yeah that's a boat and change mm -hmm. well. you haven't factored in all the beer <laughs> it's okay. The beer goes in the truck. <laughs> That's what the bed's for. You fill it full of ice. Yeah, it's ballast. It's fine. Yeah. It'll keep the sway down. All right. Now, moving on to the very last thing of the day, and feel free to leave comments uh, either in the uh, YouTube comments for when this hits there, and of course, down below for uh, any of the vehicles that you think would be better off back in the world that, you ha that we haven't touched on. But uh, we've got some notes on aviation from our no uh, local Flying Fox. Yes. Ah, yes. The, the aviation minute. So I'll, I'll open this up with a tale from Friday. We had a jet in the shop that we had just completed a uh, series of phase inspections on, which included an oil change. And without getting into too much of the nitty-gritty details... 
when you do an oil change on a turbine engine, when you're complete, you need to build oil pressure and uh, see that it's not leaking. The way that you do this is by activating the starter generator. And it never ceases to amuse me whenever we do this in the shop, how many people come rushing to the window to see why it is that we're starting a jet in the shop. <laughs> and please, drink in this beautiful sound. Here we go. And... Now so there's a little bit of a screamer. There's absolutely no danger of the engine actually starting because we have the breakers for the igniters and the fuel pump pulled. So no sparky, no gassy, no fire. You need the three, <laughs> the triangle. Got the air, but no spark of fuel. Uh-huh. Yep, that is the, the those jets start up off of the uh, the starter generator, which is like the alternator also. And they, it's one and the same. Uh, it can fu once the engine's running, it functions as a generator. But for startup, it just spools everything up, and then you introduce fuel and lightning, and fire happens, and anger and violence. <laughs> Especially if the chocks aren't there. But later on in the day, uh, we had to take the jet out and run the engines to make sure that we had successfully not broken anything after fixing it. And as mechanics do, we get bored. So we just start playing with things. And I discovered an unfamiliar box on my side of the cockpit and asked my coworker, what does this do? And he looked over and said, I don't know, turn it on and find out. So I turned it on, and we were both delighted to find the most lazy piece of electronics we've ever seen in an airplane. <laughs> May we have your attention, please? We will be landing shortly. Please fasten your seat belt and shoulder strap. Also, stow loose items and executive tables. All seats must be placed in the outward position with the armrest down. Make certain the aisle is clear. Continue to observe the no smoking sign. Thank you. Fuck you. <laughs> Wee. Take him a job. Yes, pre-recorded messages for the passengers for every phase of flight. Take him a job. <laughs> But you know what? If I were a pilot, I would have used that every single time. Especially, <laughs> I figure, as you're coming in for... It, on landing, it makes more sense. If you're just sitting there and taxiing, uh, be personal. Come on. But landing, there's probably a lot of stuff, a lot of moving parts going on up there. Maybe it makes it easier. Or... Yodi. Yodi. Just for the chance to do it, I'd be lazy. Yodi. You've personally flown with me. And as yeah, much and it was as we'd very like professional you, the first time, as much as we'd like you to think so, we're not that busy. There's one big problem with those automated announcements, though. How am I supposed to know it's from the captain if it doesn't start with? Uh, uh, nah. uh, well, ladies everybody. and gentlemen. Nah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Well, perhaps we should just get you to record the messages from now on. I mean, no you do have the chops. That's true. But no one would understand me. <laughs> Go ahead. Try us on. Give us give us one. Oh, Put me on the spot. Me. My problem is if I did that, I'd just invariably end up saying this service and people would be like, what? Eh? <laughs> what? <laughs> Go on. Matt. Fine. We're now making our approach into the 710 cast airport. We'll be, we'll be arriving shortly. Wind's coming from the right, so don't be surprised if we get blown into the trees. 
Your luggage will be available at the luggage carousel. We do promise to ensure that it's as beaten as possible. Please stow your tray tables and ensure loose items are jammed firmly up your backside. Thank you. <laughs> I'm clapping. You can't hear it, but I'm clapping. <laughs> Broken for the rest of the night. <laughs> All right. Now we've... Uh, covered i think or everything we're looking to cover and we're coming up very close on an hour so i think as a group we'll be bidding you adieu and thank you for sticking around with us while we've chatted out those lost bodies we wish we could dig up car bodies car bodies yeah those, i mean just, car bodies those are the only ones you don't have to worry about anything we don't talk else. about the other bodies yes no we don't what, what are the bodies no <laughs> so from myself Kaji and from my co-hosts Tamarack and the Yodi over there Eli Yo. I'd like to thank you once again uh, shout out to the artist who put together our uh, background for us Yagoda I have this I have this do you do it. come on come Quick. on bring up the card do it come on do it I'm working on do it do it now do pressure it miss you. more pressure <laughs> there it is friend of the chat and more than uh more than helpful when we needed uh a piece done at short notice feel free to give him a hoy and darn good work too yes and of course i'll pop in here for this one for the walking dog that is correct. All of the music that you heard throughout the stream tonight was brought to you by Walking Dog Music. They create all kinds of really awesome, very chill, very fun tunes that are copyright-free, DMCA-free, so you can use them on your streams, on your videos, anywhere you want to put them, and you're not going to get struck down for it. So go ahead and give them a listen. It's good stuff. There's all kinds of different genres they've done, little dips here and there, but it's all good listens. I had one cranking yesterday while I was uh, wrestling carburetors off a motorcycle. It wasn't bad. Yeah. I didn't have to worry about offending the neighbors with my taste in rap. <laughs> nice. <laughs> but yes, once again, thank you for sticking around with us and we shall bid you adieu for this evening and until next time. Yep, for those of you who are on the YouTube, don't forget to like and subscribe and all that good stuff. If you're here with us on Twitch, feel free to follow. We appreciate it. And for everything else, 710 Cast, if you want to check us out in the meantime, we also do these streams weekly right about this time. We also have the YouTube channel, as Kaji had said there. Go ahead and check things out. Subscribe, like, do all that good stuff. Comment on stuff from the past that you haven't heard before now. And... Uh, that's about it. I think we're also on Discord. Come and join us there. We share all kinds of stuff. We, we're pretty active on there. So come and give us a holler. And a quick shout out to Bucket Monkey and good night. That is Thank all. Thank you and good night. Bye-bye. <laughs>